Okay. Should I pass something around? Or, oh, sorry. Yeah. It's somewhere here. So today we're going to be learning something from inside. Geras HaKadosh, fourth volume of Tanya, chapter 14, or we call it Simon Yudalid. In, in this part of the beginning of Tanya, it's called chapter. Over here we call it Simon, Simon Yudalid. This is quoted a lot in the Sikhs. It's a very fundamental a chapter which talks about the Rosh Hashanah. And uh, we'll do the whole chapter. It's a small, small, small one. So just to give a little introduction, they have it here in English, that um, at a certain point, one of the most, one of the most leading students of the Mazir Magid whose name was Rabbi Mendel Haradokar, he and a few other Hasidic rabbis could no longer tolerate they were being persecuted by those who were against Hasidus and in a very, very difficult way. So they picked themselves up together with many other families. Not sure how many all together, but it was a big group. And they all went to Eretz Yisrael. And they settled in the city of Hebron. And in fact, the Alter Rebbe was on the way as well. He was also leaving and going with them. And in the middle of the journey, he discussed it once again with Rabbi Tana Docker, was a student of the Magid. But after the passing of the Mazich Magid, the Alter Rebbe did relate to him because he was one of the oldest students. The Alter Rebbe was the youngest student. He looked up to him like a mentor, like a Rebbe to some extent. And therefore, he discussed with him whether he should leave or not. And the decision was made, was made that he should go back and he should spread Hasidus. And in fact, al Rebbe became the leader of all the Hasidic groups that he took it upon himself to organize different things to spread Hasidus. But because they were all going to Eretz Yisrael, and in those days, Eretz Yisrael was a country that there was a lot of poverty there, the al Rebbe took it upon himself even though he's not going, but he will collect money to support the families there. And that tzedakah is what's known as koilal chabad, which means that um, there is a tzedakah fund, then Babbage custom, every Friday afternoon, every Yantav afternoon before candle lighting, <clears throat> a woman gives tzedakah in that pushka. This was established by the Alter Rebbe in many, many years ago, over 200 years ago, and for that purpose. So that's why most of the letters in the Geras HaKodesh, which are all letters, that's what it means. Igeris means letters. Most of them are about tzedakah in general, and specifically what's unique about giving tzedakah for Eretz Yisrael. So this is one of them. And apparently when the Alter Rebbe wrote this letter, people weren't as enthusiastic as they were originally to send money to Eretz Yisrael to support those families. So that's how the Alter Rebbe begins his letter, that it's, we should sort of revive that enthusiasm, that excitement that they had in the past. That's how it starts. <clears throat> this letter is written to arouse the old love, which means that love for Eretz Yisrael that was there before, and the fondness for Eretz Yisrael. It should be burning like fiery flames. A fire coming from the depth of a person, from the depth of his heart. As if this was the very day, the first time that it happened, that Hashem put a spirit upon us. This Nadev Am the Malas Yodam Lashem Yod Malay or Achaiva. So people should volunteer to consecrate themselves, which means dedicate themselves to Hashem with a full and generous hand. Basically, we make Shekhyan when something is new, because when it's new, there's a certain excitement, no matter how good something is, no matter how pleasurable something is, once you have it ongoing, it's good. 
but you, it loses a certain thrill, a certain excitement. That's in the beginning. So we make Shech Yenu only in the beginnings. And that's why Sheva Brachas can only be made of as a Ponim Chadoshes, which means somebody knew. If everybody in the room was at the wedding or at a Sheva Brachas, you can't make Sheva Brachas because there's something lacking in the Simcha. If there's somebody new that wasn't by a previous Sheva Brachas or by the wedding, then you can make the Brachas because there's a certain excitement in the room that wasn't there before. So the author was saying, let this be as if this was the day, I guess it means that Hashem gave us Eretz Yisrael as a gift. And we can imagine what the excitement was. That's what we should feel now. And everyone should dedicate themselves by being generous. And not only being generous and to continue, but to actually add from year to year. To rise and give more, the meat is Kedish Elyon. In being consistent with a measure of Kedish Elyon, with Supreme Holiness, which we'll soon explain what that means. That level, which he refers to as Supreme Holiness, is Meir Leretz Kedish. That's the level of godly light that shines and radiates in Eretz Yisrael. Amaschadish, Amisrabe, Tamid. But it's not something that shines and then it just continues as is, but it's something which is constantly renewed. And when we say renewed, we mean renewed in quality and in quantity. What is this based on? It says, Tamid, Eine Hashem, Alekechaba, Mereshe, Zashana, Vadach, Roshana. Eretz is a land that Hashem has his eyes upon the land from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So these words, the words to the end of the year, ain't a movement, it's not understood. Why? When one year ends, the second year begins. And when the second year ends, the third year begins. In the page. So therefore, it should have said, Hashem has his eyes on the land forever. Why say from the beginning of the year to the end of the year if it's all the same? So clearly, it's not the same. Clearly, it's from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And the next year, it's something different. And the next year, it's something different. And that's why he, he expresses it that way, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, even though it's constant, without any interruption. So this will be understood. Based on what it says, Hashem b'chokma yosad eretz. God established the earth with chokma, with wisdom. The simple meaning is that when Hashem created the universe, He created with wisdom. All the wisdom that we see in the world, all the science we see. But the deeper meaning of these words are, she said eretz al yena. It's referring to the supreme eretz, the spiritual eretz. Eretz on a higher level. What's Eretz on a higher level? Ibchinus Mamalakolamen. That's the level that's called Mamalakolamen, the light of Hashem that fills all the worlds. Which means there's something in the spiritual realm which is the counterpart of Eretz Yisrael down here. I'm sure you've heard, and there's a song, a famous song with these words, that Hashem promised or swore. That he's not going to go into your shalayim up there until he goes into your shalayim down here, which means, want to say something? No. no. Which means that your shalayim is down here on earth, a physical city, but there's a place in the heavenly realm which is the counterpart of that your shalayim. And the same way with all of Eretz Yisrael, there's a place lamaila in the spiritual realm that corresponds to Eretz Yisrael. And that's called Eretz Chefetz. It's known as the land that Hashem desires. And that corresponds to the heavenly counterpart, which is what he said before, the supernal Eretz. Um, yeah. Have yeah. So as I'm saying, over here, he's not talking about Yerushalayim, he's talking about all of Eretz Yisrael. Yesh Eretz Yisrael Lamailo, Yesh Eretz Yisrael Khan. Up there, it's called Eretz HaChaim, the land of life. And why is it called the land of life? Because obviously it's a source of life. 
הנה הוא נמשך ממשוך אז באור אז חוכמי לא מקור חיים אל יין. So which level in all the spheres does it come from? Specifically is the sphere of Chochma. Because Chochma is the source of all life. And Kedeksiv, as it says in the Pasuk, next page, La Chochma techaye baleho. Chochma animates and gives life to those who possess Chochma. So basically it means that Chochma is a source of life. And the truth is, we know that we get life from all the spheres. But what's the first sphere? Which is the first sphere, which is the source of all the spheres, is Chochma. Remember, we went through in one of the classes, when we spoke about Rosh Hashanah, that the beginning usually includes all the details that will follow, whether it's the first day of the year, the first day of a month, the first words in a parsha, and many firsts. That once this is the first, it includes everything that follows later. So Chochmah is the first of the ten spheres. It's not just first chronologically. It means Chochmah contains in it all the life force that is, after that, distributed to Bina, Daz, Chesed, Gevura, Teferis, and goes to other spheres. But Chochmah is the source of all life. This light and this radiance is Chadeshes Ba'er Chadesh Mamesh B'chol Shana V'Shana. Every year it's renewed with a new light. In other words, it's Chochmah, but it's coming from a new place, from a deeper place than before. How can it be deeper? Chochmah is the highest spirit. But it says, We know that Hashem and His attributes are one. So Hashem and His attribute of Chochmah is also one. And Hashem is Ainsaf, He's infinite. So just like He's infinite, His Chochmah is also infinite. Which means there's infinite depth to Chochmah. Not one layer of depth, not ten layers of depth, but infinite, legal layers of depth in Chochmah. Shein sof ve'en keitz l'maylas v'gdula sa'or v'achayis ha'nimshik m'menu yizborech m'chochmasi. There's no end to the wisdom and to the life that comes from Hashem. You can go deeper and deeper and higher and higher, and there's no end to it. The ili acharili aden keitz v'tachlis l'reim ha'maylas l'mayla mayla. You can even think of it as we think in terms of terror. Remember, when you learn about Mashiach, we know that when Mashiach is going to come, he's going to teach Torah to the Tanoim, Amorayim, Nevi'im, the others, Moshe Rabbeinu, yeah? And, and Rabbi Akiva, and, and not just, we're talking about tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of the greatest giants of the Torah that ever lived are going to be sitting and listening to Mashiach. What's there to listen to? They know the whole Torah. They have the whole Torah in their fingertips. And the answer is, you can know the whole Torah, but in terms of depth, it's deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So when does it end? The answer is, it doesn't end. Ain't self means that it has no end. Because Hashem is ain't self with infinite. Like the science, like every year, they find more things about this. About... Yes, you know why? Because science is Hashem's chokhmah with which he created the world. So it really has no end. <clears throat> This is the Chachmoth, which Hashem created the world. So every year, every year, it's not a recycle, it's not a repeat, but a deeper level of Chachmoth comes down into the world. What kind of level? This Chachmoth from Hashem never yet before shined to that level of Eretz Yisrael, the way it is in Shemaim. In other words, it's the first time that such a deep level of Chochmah is shining. And the second year is the first time that a new deeper layer of Chochmah is shining. And the fourth year, and every year it's a much deeper level of Chochmah that's being revealed that was never ever here in creation since the beginning. Which means that this year is 5,783, so if we can use those terms, it's the 5,783rd layer of depth 
that's being revealed that was never revealed before. And what happens? And he describes how this happens. Ki er kol shana v'shana, the light which Hashem emanated of himself last year to give chayas for this whole year, or the light that was there two years ago to give chayas for the whole year, that light, mystalic, it withdraws. Where does it go? It goes back to its source, the Sharshay. When does that happen? At Rosh Chodesh. On Rosh Chodesh, all the chayas, all the life energy that Hashem expressed of himself, and he gave out of himself to give life to this world. On the last day of the year, it all goes back into its source. And that's Kisha Chaydish Maskasa, when the moon is covered. In other words, what happens here in the physical world is at Rosh Chodesh, Rosh Hashanah, at Rosh Hashanah, you don't see the moon anymore. It's hidden. Spiritually, this is a reflection of something that's happening spiritually that the chayas that Hashem invests in creation, and that's causing everything to happen every single day of the year, the last day of the year, when the moon is no longer to be seen, is because that chayas goes back to its source. So there's nothing to see. It's gone. And then, so this is one of the things that Shefer accomplishes by blowing the Shefer and by saying the davening, we draw down this new light, a new light which is superior to what was there before. A light that's from a higher place of Hashem's supreme wisdom. And that light shines. It radiates to the, to the superior Eretz Yisrael, the one that's up there. All the higher Eretz and the lower elements, they all get chayas from this new light that's shining. They get chayas from this infinite light of Hashem, and from the chachma of Hashem, and the insub that's in chach. Kedixiv, as it says, ki imcha meker chayim ba'ercha nira er. With you is the source of life. In other words, in Chachma is the source of life. And your light shall we see light, which means this light comes to us and gives us, that's our source of Chayas. Now in the parentheses, he says like this, of Kaneda that's known, Yerdechein, Shebuchal Rosh Hashanah, Kuhayna Nesira, Omekabel Asmechen, Chadashim Al Yenim Yesem. So this is a Kabbalah, it's in parentheses. Yep. Oh, the light that's drawn down, Erev Rosh Chodesh, Rosh Hashanah, like, is that containing the light of all of the months of the year? Or yeah. is it doing it every month? Also? No, it's containing all the lights of all the months of the year. Every month, and we'll learn later, every week, and even every day, there's a certain process which is similar on a smaller scale. But in general, it happens once a year, Erev Rosh Hashanah, when all the light that's invested in this world, that was spent by Hashem in this world, goes back to its source. Now, what he's going to, what he's going to compare it to, I get one more second, is he compares it to what happened the first day of when the world was created, not the first day of creation, but the first day of Rosh Hashanah is the day that Adam was created. What happened on that day? Hashem took Adam and he put him to sleep. Put him to sleep. And what happened after that? There was something new that occurred. A new human being came into existence, Chava. And as a result of that, the two of them together brought infinite generations into the world. Which means, spiritually, in a sense, what happened, what he describes is, 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 in a way, the process of what happens to every person every day when we go to sleep. During the day, our energy is spent. And that's why you might have heard from certain people in certain countries that at night, before they're ready to go to bed, they're tired, they're exhausted, they're drained, because all the energy was taken out. How is it possible if I was so tired 12 o'clock last night that seven hours later, I'm all fresh and chayas, I'm jumping, I'm all, I'm all uh, worked up. How, how did that happen? Seven hours later, I should be even more tired. 
So I went to sleep. So what is sleep? So Exodus explains sleep is that all the energy that was spent during the day goes back into the source, which is the neshama. And then new energy comes from the neshama. And that new energy is new. So therefore, I'm back refreshed all over again. In a certain sense, that's what happened to the whole creation on the day of Rosh Hashanah. Hashem created the world Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then on that day, the fact that Adam was put to sleep was sort of a reflection of what was going on on, on the global, universal, all the world's level, that everything went to sleep, which means all the highs in creation went back into its source. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the highs was coming out of the source, being spent into creation. And before, on Friday, with Adam, when he put to sleep, it went back to the source. What happened? A new life came down. How did that manifest down here? That a new person was born, which was Chava, and together they were able to create new people, new generations, and infinite generations. Yeah. I was going to ask, where does Kasek manifest? It's Kokla has a better so much. Is that like orange soap? Right. Have you noticed? I didn't, I didn't stop to talk about it because I didn't want to interrupt the flow. But on top of the page, it says, In other words, we're talking about Chachma, but there's a chapter in Tanya, in the first part of Tanya, chapter 19. Where he explains what is unique about Chokhmah, not only that it's the first of the ten spheres, but the infinite light of Hashem, of Keser, shines in Chokhmah only. And the fact that it could even shine to other spheres is because Chokhmah carries it there. There's a certain aspect of Chokhmah in Bina, aspect of Chokhmah in Das, wherever it is, how can Or and Sov get there? The vehicle for Or and Sov, the infinite light of Hashem, to get someplace is only through Chokhmah. So when we say that Chachma is shining, Chachma is sort of the outer garment. And there's even something deeper, which is the Ein Sof, the light of Kesa, which is infinite. Chachma is like translucent, like, so to speak. Like, right, it doesn't conceal. So Ein Sof could be revealed in Chachma. Yeah. Do you feel like a loss when this happened in the era of Shana, when like, the, most, the light of the world came back? Do you feel like we're lacking? We don't feel, but it says that the Baal Shem Tov, and it's also found with other tzaddikim, that they would, they would, uh, they saw on them that as Rosh Hashem was approaching closer to the time of candlelighting or something, they would briefly fall asleep. Not go asleep, fall asleep. Because if up there that's what's happening, then it happens down here. In fact, in a, to a certain extent, this happens every month which means every Rosh Chodesh is the same thing. Every Rosh Chodesh, all the energy that was spent by Hashem during this month goes back to its source. And on Rosh Chodesh, new energy comes, but it's not totally new because it was really renewed on Rosh Hashanah, but it's relatively new. Is that connected that it's drawing us to Rosh Hashanah? If it's connected, it's probably connected, but it says in Shechon is we shouldn't have our mazel shouldn't be shouldn't fall shouldn't be a sleepy mazel, but it's probably connected to that. That the time to sleep is before Rosh Hashanah, not on Rosh Hashanah. And then I get to you one more second. Every week we have the same process on a smaller scale, and that is Friday at the end of the week. Friday is the day that all the chayes that spent during the week by Hashem goes back to its source. That's and that's on Shabbos. And the new chais through the new week gets prepared to come down to this world on Shabbos. So basically, all week the chais is going downward, and on Shabbos it's going back to its source. Shabbos, Friday. I mean, the, the, the technical detail, which hour, which moment, is another discussion. But this is the difference between Friday and Shabbos, all week and Rosh Chodesh, all year and Rosh Hashanah, is the chais going back up to its source, and new chais coming back out again. And on a smaller, smaller scale, this happens every morning with us when we wake up in the morning and we feel new chayas is because spiritually it's also happening on a smaller scale. Yeah. Um, the right there ruled uh, on Kesar, and you said it was 
not the otiot, but the, the or. Otiot are only a lavush through which the or signs. But the chayas and the light, the energy, that's what goes back to the Milo. Yes, to a certain extent, uh, I, uh, it's not that Hashem stops everything because then there wouldn't be a world. There wouldn't be a world. So obviously, He speaks. But the highest in the words and the energy in the words that goes back to the source. There's a lot, a lot of my mind. It's really a lot of huge subjects. I'm just introducing the general idea. But Prati Prati, yes, here he says that, and the more, by the way, this explains that um, the Alter Rebbe also used to fall asleep every Friday afternoon. And but then their sleeping wasn't sleeping because they were tired. Their sleeping was because they were so aligned with what's going on up there. And when up there, there's that mode of upwards, then down here, there was upward. There's a famous story with the Mazucha Magid, which illustrates this, that the Mazucha Magid's Hasidim used to recite the entire Shir of Shirim every Friday afternoon before Shabbos begins. It's not a Chabad custom, but there's some that have the custom today to do that. One day, the Maggid sent a student into the shul and he said, tell him, his name, one of the students, his name was Aaron Karlina, one of the greatest students of the Maggid. Please tell him to stop saying Shir of Shirim. Why? Because his shir Hashim is creating a commotion in heaven. And the commotion doesn't let me sleep. So I should stop saying shir Hashim. When the Hasidim heard this, they weren't amazed about, wow, his shir Hashim must really be amazing. They were saying, wow, the Rebbe's sleeping must be amazing. Yes, I was saying shir Hashim. The shir Hashim is so powerful that it's creating a commotion in heaven, and it's still more important for the Rebbe to sleep than him saying shir Hashim. Because when a Rebbe sleeps, it's not the sleep the way we know it. It means that he is allowing and manifesting what's going on in his spiritual realm to manifest down here in this. Sleep. So we don't say shir Hashim at that time? Or is it like, what? So we don't say shir Hashim there at Shabbos? No, I don't know the reason. Sure. He's like, not to mess with that, like, quiet time. So the Alter Rebbe also used to fall asleep. And it's interesting, he was a chassid of the Mitzvah Rebbe, a very big chassid. His name was Abhil Paracha. And he would do things according to Kabbalah. So he would also go to sleep at Shabbos. But the chassidim used to say the difference is, Abhil Paracha used to go to sleep. The Alter Rebbe used to fall asleep. What's the difference? In other words, he went to sleep because according to Kabbalah, it's a time for that. Now, the Rebbe didn't go to sleep. He was so connected to what's going on up there that when it's a time of sleep up there, he fell asleep down here. In fact, the Rebbe was filling all day. You're not allowed to sleep in Tfilin. But he didn't go to sleep. He just fell asleep. So it was different. So this is what's happening on, on Air Rosh Hashanah and happens every single day to a certain smaller scale. Every morning when we daven, there's also a new, sort of a little bit new, of that light shines into the world. This is not the, the, what was there before that left, that left from the day before when you davened. This is a new light. The light of the day before went back to its source, and now it's a new light. So like I said before, on a daily basis, it happens every morning. On a weekly basis, it happens every Friday. On a monthly basis, it happens every Rosh Chodesh. And on a yearly basis, it happens once a year. That's when it's renewed for the whole year. Did I answer your question? I don't remember. Yeah, I answered the question. Okay. Enayim, the word Enayim, of course, Hashem has no physical eyes. So obviously it's referring to a certain spiritual level. Enayim, the eyes, represent Chochm. In fact, there's a passage in Chumash where it says, if this thing was uh, concealed from the eyes of the community, 
So the Gemara says, what's the eyes of the community? It means the sages of the community. Why are sages called eyes? Because they have wisdom. So the eyes is, 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 um, is, is some, like a metaphor for Chochmah. I mean, in Hasidus, it talks a lot about the difference between vision and hearing, audio and visual. That vision is connected to Chochmah. In other words, both are an intellectual process of perceiving intellect, perceiving knowledge. But when you perceive knowledge in a visual process, it's Chochmah. When you perceive knowledge in an audio process, it's Bina. And that's the difference between Ruvain and Shimon. Ruvain is Ru, vision. Shimon is hearing, audio, and many other places. Another example he gives, the Gemara says, Avira that just throw Machkin. That the atmosphere, people who come from Israel have more wisdom. The atmosphere there makes a person have more wisdom. Why? Because the eyes of Hashem are on the land, and the eyes of Hashem is Chochmah. This light that's shining, I goes back to conclude. It's tmidus, it's constant, but nevertheless, it's not the same. It's a new light. And this new light, whatever is going to be revealed that this year goes back on Ere Rashana to its source. And what comes out? Something new, something deeper. And that's why it says, And why does it spell Rashis in such a strange way? There's an olive missing. Rashis is spelled Rej Alev Shin Yudsof. In this Pasik, it's spelled Rej Shin Yudsof. And that's why the word Reishis is missing the letter Aleph. Let's turn the page. Reimez al This alludes to the fact that the light is going to be hidden. It's going back to the source. So the Aleph is gone. And when does it happen? The night of Rosh Hashanah. And when exactly does this take place? Ad achat kis. Until blowing of the shofar. That's the answer. Yes, the first day. What does the shofar accomplish? Once you blow the shofar, yered er chadash elyon yoyse. When you blow the shofar, that brings down a new light. Shloim meir adai. This light never was shining in this creation since the world was created. Umislabesh umistate beretz achaim shalemayla. This light becomes invested in Eretz Yisrael up there, and then from there it evolves to Eretz Yisrael down here. This is the source of life and sustenance for everything in creation for the entire year. And it's all good. How do I reveal that light? And how much of that light will be revealed to me, which means it will manifest in different kind of brachas. That depends on the actions, their merits, the tshuva, and the tshuva. The Daila Maven, and this will suffice for those who understand. So, what's happening? If, it, if, it, if it's delayed, I don't know, I'd have to look it up. But generally speaking, it must mean, it says in Chassidus, we mentioned in one of the classes, that when we don't blow Shepherds, because Shabbos in itself on Rosh Hashanah will accomplish what the Shaper accomplishes. So obviously that light is coming down, not with us blowing, but just by the fact that we're observing Shabbos. On the second day, we blow the Shaper and we'll bring it down more probably. And we'll learn later that this whole process of up and down is incomplete until Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is sort of the end of the up and the end of the down. The old light goes completely up, and the new light comes completely down. And if we have time, hopefully we will. We'll see how that leads later into Sukkot and to Shmini Yeah. Yes. Um, what's the um, definitely connected to that, but that's even more. That's when Mashiach comes, will be a new light, even more than what happens just every day or every month or every year. But that's like, sounds like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the spiritual light in the world has to do with the sun and the moon. 
So the fact that the moon will be like the sun, and the sun will be Shiva Sayim seven times as much, it's all part of what's going to happen. Yeah, this, this is for you. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, the, the time, there's like a small gap between the first night of Rosh Hashanah when the light goes away and so we hear the Shaifar. Is there like a certain energy? What's being given to the world then, or is there like, I guess, a lot? Um, the, the question is we'll hear more about the technicalities. What's happening this hour and that hour? How does it work? I'm not sure if there's even a environment that goes into explaining the detail, but there might be. Generally speaking, it just suffices for my little brain to understand that generally this is what's happening during this time. There is an explanation of what's the difference between Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Ashmi, etc. That we do have exactly the details, you know, the first day, the second day. The fact that we have two days of Shana means this whole process needs 48 hours to be complete. That's what it means. Thank you're, you. you're very welcome. Those welcome to come here. Yes. You.